Okay, I think we are off and running. Now, um, Maxine, do you still have volume and still have visual? Um, yes, I can still see you and I can see the slideshow and I can hear you. Fantastic, and we are now recording as well. All right, wonderful. So we've managed to get round the limitations of the system once more. My, my apologies for that. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, it's one thing to log in as myself. I then apparently have to log in as CQU as well just to get this to work. But anyway, let's get cracking. Um, what I'm going to do, there's five of us online, which is a small group, um, but it's probably a good group. What I really want you to do is act like a bit of a Greek chorus tonight. So if something comes up, um, and you're not sure what that something is, um, really, I want, want to encourage you, please, to ask those questions and, and get them, um, you know, get, get things out there in the open um, so that we can actually explore some of the options because I've got about 30 slides tonight. So the aim is um, potentially that we can get through them um, fairly quickly um, if you don't ask too many questions, but, um, but we can stop and, and, and graze on those patches where um, you want to know a little bit more. So I'm going to follow the usual format. And what I'll try and do is get my little um, highlighter up here so that we can um, look at the four things we're going to do. I'm going to do a brief overview of the week. And I do apologise. I was actually unwell last week, so I was away from the university the entire week, so I'm still playing catch-up. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about assessment task two. Um, I'm also going to look at some of the, the comments coming from the forums and a lot from the email. Now, the reality is I want you all to relax. I mean, you're spread over a fair degree of, of um, progress at the moment. Some people are starting the assessment task this week. I want you to know you're not alone. There's quite a few students in that category. Some people are almost finished. I want you to know you're not alone. So there is no one way to complete this assessment. Um, you're all at different points. Um, the reality is, is to work with where you're at. Ask questions from where you're at. So let's let's work out what's good advice and let's work out what's misconceptions. And the final thing I want to do is, is talk briefly about next week where we point to some, some of the resources that you can actually take forward with you on your science journey. So when we look at engagement, and that's the topic for the week. I mean, here we've got four scientists. You may be able to identify them. Um, this one we know, for instance, is, is not Bob Dylan. It's actually Albert Einstein. Um, believe it or not, they looked at the spitting image when they were really young. There's two photos. Madame Curie, uh, David Uniapin, and, of course, people don't know Noam Chomsky all that well, but it's the brilliant Noam Chomsky there on the right-hand side. Now, imagine if you gave the students a task, if you could go back and, and meet a scientist and have lunch with them or, or go to a movie with them. What would the movie be and who would the scientists be? And of course, here's a lovely way to interest, you know, David Unopin, who is an Indigenous man, an Injiri man, um, a, a, an inventor. Um, he invented, you know, some, some of the very initial shears and, and clipping instruments for shearing sheep. Um, he's also in our $50 note. You may notice um, David's... Um, um, history there. But the point I want to raise here is often when we look at science and, and we, we neglect the human um, endeavour strand and we can have a lot of fun by going in via the human endeavour strand. Einstein is probably overly popular. Um, now there's a lot of claims coming out now about his wife who was also a scientist, his first wife, um, arguing that she she's actually responsible for a lot of his initial theories. Madame Curie is, is you know, again a brilliant sort of um, French um, comical figure in many ways. David Uniapin, an indigenous man bringing in indigenous perspectives and Noam Chomsky of course is, is quite a radicalist. He, he's a, um, you know, a linguist by nature and, and takes a very, very controversial view of science and, and, and progress. So when we look at this week's material, it's all about engagement and we can go in with all guns blazing human endeavour because one thing science does, it creates accidental outcomes. And those accidental outcomes can be ethical dilemmas, they can be a whole range of things and that's an excellent spot for us to enter, um, particularly when we start to look at assessment. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Key terms, engagement, the five E's, POE, PBL, four C's, whatever you want to call it, and motivation. That's, our, that's the pool we're swimming in this week. Engagement is when stu students get involved in their learning, and motivation is, is sustaining that. Okay, so that's, that's the real focus of assessment task number two. Talking about engagement, how assessment, assessment actually connects engagement and content through, through task-based and, and procedural um, knowledge acquisition. And finally, this thing called motivation, which is, is the long-term, the sustaining of that through pedagogical design. So it's, you know, it's an interesting topic this week and one that well brings us into our, our you know, the round of closes the full circle of the course. Gregson talks about two, you know, the elements of engagement and Gregson's chapter is reasonable. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but the only thing is for it to make a lot of sense, you know, when we talk about the elements of engagement, um, behavioural, emotional, cognitive, um, you need to think back on your own experience for that to make a lot of sense. 
Um, so you can think back to the teacher or mentor who helped you to learn something. And, and did they directly instruct you or did they challenge you or did they give you tasks to do? Um, you know, what was their feedback mechanism? What worked for you? What made the learning easier? And what did that teacher do to ensure that you felt safe in a classroom? And, you know, these are all the kinds of things that we talk about when we talk about behavioural, emotional and cognitive engagement strategies. And we'll go on and look a, a little bit more at a few of these tonight. Dr. Christine Redman talks about acknowledging the learner. Now, um, some of you haven't come across her work yet. Um, anyone who's a member of the Queensland College of Teachers, and you probably all should be, um, you'll know that on there, there's a, uh, on the Queensland College of Teachers site, there is a um, video unit um, for you to do on behaviour management. It's a really good little behaviour management unit, and Christine Redman is the host for that. And she talks through um, a four part series on, on behavior management. And she talks about acknowledging the learner um, and you know, acknowledging the small e and the big e engagement. And what do we mean by small e and big e? Okay, I mean, here she is. I won't play the video, okay, because you won't hear the sound through, um, through um, Zoom, unfortunately. But when we talk about Gregson, small e, big e, you know, the big e engagement is the kids who go in there and, and they feel at home. You know, they've got the cultural capital. These are the kids that know what, what school is all about. Um, and it's, you know, it's part of their life, part of their future. And then you've got the small e engagement, you know, where you're talking about kids who are slowly, incrementally finding their way into a school classroom. So, you know, it's really important that we distinguish between these two different frameworks. We've got kids who are culturally close to schooling. They're rich in the, the cultural capital. And we've got kids who are remotely distant and the cultural capital there is quite low. Um, and Christine Redman talks about this as small e and, and big e. It's been adopted by Gregson. And, you know, um, there's lots of things you can do as a teacher, um, even body language and even proximity in a classroom. You can move amongst the kids you know that are struggling um, and you can move amongst them and you can be a present, you can be a guide on the side. All of these different things are about positioning, about small e and big e engagement. So engagement is not all about wowing their minds and winning their souls. Sometimes it's just about being a present um, and positive force in their life. So when students are engaged, um, Martin Haberman in 1996, and one of my favorite theorists, as you see, he's a little bit old now, but so am I, but no one writes quite like Haberman, and, and uh, he's a German guy and, and wrote some brilliant stuff. But he talks about student engagement as being, students are engaged when they're involved in issues they regard as vital concerns. Now look, Yes, this is very Germanic when you look at the culture here. You know, Germans are very politically involved people. But Haberman is writing in 1996. It's about issues they regard as vital. It's about being helped to see major concepts, big ideas and general principles, and not simply isolated facts. Now, look, he's 20 years before the Australian curriculum, involved in planning what they are doing. So kids, it's a, it's a student-centred curriculum. And they're involved in applying ideas such as fairness, equity and justice to their world. And this is a big thing. I mean, this can be traced back to the German experience in World War II, um, the treatment of, of Germans and as a result of, of the, uh, um, the, uh, you know, the Jewish apocalypse, all those kinds of things um, that we can, we, history reports on and, and discusses. Um, but the, also the, the change process that, that German society went through in the 20 years preceding the Second World War. And so there became a, a huge cultural fascination with fairness, equity, justice. Um, and of course, this is coming through in, in, in German education as well. But Haberman was well, well before his time when he's writing about these concepts. And again, when we look, we can find these concepts most alive in the human endeavour strand. And, and we can look at the things like creativity. And these are some of the things that we talk about you know, a lot in this course, um, about role playing, about art, about poetry. We don't all have to be scientists, but we could all be creative spirits. And if we are creative spirits and souls, then we are innovating. We're talking about ingenuity. We're talking about imagination. And when we're doing that, we can raise aesthetics, beauty, sentiment, contemplation. When we do that, we can talk about ethics. Okay, we do have science, but you know, we've got virtues, we've got rights, and we've got justices. Three, three different concepts appearing there. And of course, this wonderful thing called rhetoric. You know, we call it science literacy. But really, it's rhetoric. It's about expression, representation, and persuasion. So when we look at the human endeavour stand strand, we can see so much, so much of Haberman's thinking coming through, and we can see that you know the human endeavour strand is a really rich way of looking at this engagement equation. Okay, because often um, science content does not engage students, 
Science inquiry skills can seem pedantic and outside most students' normal frameworks, but their imagination, their creativity, their aesthetics, the ethics, the rhetoric of the world they live in can be touched upon easily. But the whole problem with science at the moment is it, we're looking at science participation rates are in rapid decline. And we know this despite the, you know, the, the inception of this thing we call STEM. Now, science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics. And, and this little pyramid represents things nicely and it's, it's a very historic diagram. Uh, so on this side, we've got STEAM and STEAM includes, uh, sorry, it's STEM. And on this side, we've got STEAM with the addition of the arts. And we can see now the arts is, is if you like, I mean, some research I'm doing at the moment points to the fact that uh, really poor schools, schools who lack financial and, and capital resources and cultural capital, um, don't really know a lot about STEM, don't have a lot of access to technology. Um, our, our resource poor schools are the ones who are, are basically exploring STEAM. And STEM um, is really the property of some of our richer, more financial schools private independent schools who are going forward into the STEAM agenda, STEM agenda. So when we look at what's happened in the past, we can see that, you know, once upon a time, and we go back to modernism, um, the Julian curriculum, um, around about 1950, 1960, we all had these little silos of knowledge, science, technology. Technology was really pretty quiet back before the 60s. Engineering was pretty strong, mathematics, and the arts, of course, you're the liberal arts, politics, philosophy, history, all of those things. You can see they existed as separate silos in the 1950s to 60s, even in the 70s. In the 80s, we started to see some integration, but by and large, they still existed as silos. Now, once we get round about the 90s, 2000s, we're starting to see the emergence of some multidisciplinary efforts. But a lot of these multidisciplinary efforts are by osmosis. So in other words, we don't teach an integrated subject. We still teach science, technology, engineering, maths, but we expect them somehow through osmosis to come together into STEM. Now, the reason we do this um, we try to integrate these ideas is to try and create and reverse what is happening here in participation rates with science. Our, our economists, our, our think tankers are telling us that, you know, by 2023, we are going to have 100,000 pe people short in, in our technological labour force. Um, we are seeing science rates decrease, participation in science rates at university level decrease dramatically. Um, as, as even though you know we've been running STEM agendas roughly for two to three years now and on a full full um full full beam strategy here in Queensland the Palaszczuk government have given you know 121 million dollars to STEM champions there's, you know there's another 80 million dollars in the pipeline for funding for the next year um, and what do we know about teaching well yeah at the moment by the year 2020 we're going to have 4,000 teachers short in Queensland so you know Despite all of this money being sunk in, all of this innovation and all of this agenda, science petition, uh, participation rates are dropping off. Um, people are, less people are signing up for teaching roles and the average teaching career, and this might come as a bit of a shock to you, um, but the average teaching career now is five years. So we can see here that the profession, education, sciences, we're in a little bit of a crisis. And one of the, the solutions to this has been, you know, to bring about an integration of, of traditionally um, curriculum areas that students are starting to avoid and, and have been avoiding for some quite, quite some time, particularly at senior high school levels. And we're starting to see them uh, now being migrated into you know, multidisciplinary focuses with the hope of reviving the science agenda. So we're seeing science has got some engagement issues. And, and Philip Schlecht is, is a, a US um, based uh, uh, academic and he talks about um, five, five responses that students basically have to schoolwork and this is really relevant to our discussion here of engagement because he says students can one they can be engaged, two they can be strategically compliant, um, three they can be ritually compliant, um, four they can retreat you know in other words take a backward step and five, they can be actively rebellious. And, and Schlechty identifies these three, pro, these five prototypes of, of how students respond. Um, and believe it or not, the sciences um, are actually around about three and four. So the sciences are one of those areas where it has the, the smallest level of engagement, according to Schlechty's research, um, a high level of compliance in incompetent students, and it has the highest proportion of students rejecting and rebelling against uh, the curriculum content and methods. So it, it is an area that has needed considerable 
redress. Um, you know, so when we talk about the barriers, we're talking about running out of steam. And yeah, again, high attention and commitment to tasks is a sign of engagement. Strategic compliance, high attention, but low commitment. So yeah, okay, yeah, the kids are doing things because they're basically conscientious kids. Ritual, low attention and low commitment. They're doing them because they have to. It's all about the grades. Retreatism, you know, they're going through the motions and rebellion. Well, they're focusing more on non-participation than they are on participation. So their whole scholastic identity is negatively shaped, you know. So we, Schlechty's work is really, really influential and, you know, a nice way to think about if they're not engaged, what are they? Okay, they're compliant. They're compliant for strategic reasons. In other words, they hope this will pay them back. Okay, they're compliant for ritual reasons. In other words, you know, they're probably girls, okay? You know, the, the good girls in the classroom, these sorts of things, you know, them who don't really complain about things that they should complain about. They're not being challenged. Um, they can be retreatist or they can be actively rebellious. So why is this happening? The research done by the Australian Science Association, uh, Science Teachers Association, um, identified some of the significant barriers to, to engagement to science. And it's given a really low priority, like 30 to 60 minutes per week. And that's a really low priority, isn't it, in most primary schools? And when you think about it, sometimes an assembly will kick in, sometimes there'll be something else. So it could be 30 to 60 minutes every fortnight. And, you know, the research points too that teachers are partly to blame here because teachers will teach science that they enjoy, but they won't teach science that they don't enjoy or that challenges them intellectually and academically. So um, it's not being taught with relevance either, okay? It's being, being taught um, in, in some ways in a, in, in a decontextualised way. And we talked about that in previous weeks. There's not enough experiments and hands-on material. And this is due to the fact that less than 20% of schools actually have wet labs or science labs. So most science um, that is done in primary schools is actually done without outside a wet lab or a science uh, in a setting. And therefore, there's too much content. And students and some teachers also get to think it's too hard. It's too content heavy. There's not enough hands-on stuff. There's no fun. Um, there's just too much writing. And Stahl goes on to say that, you know, when we look at science, the problem with science is that we have to review how it's taught, that we have to look at its place in society, we have to look at the human endeavour, and that learning actually takes place in communities. Now, um, we can go back and look at the whole concept of learning through, through the literature, and we can trace it back to, you know, lions and their cubs, for instance, don't sit there with whiteboards doing, you know, laptop lessons and... It, what happens is communities learn through artifacts and they then use those artifacts to sustain the learning. And, and this is what we've got to get back to with science. What are our artifacts? What are the things that we use to learn um, and how can science um, embrace them? So I'm going to talk about quickly moving on but to, from engagement um, to assessment task number two. And, and the reason and, and the, the format for doing that is to talk about the brain. So when we talk about engagement, we're actually talking about engaging the brain. You know, we don't want them smiling, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, in a science class, the more yucks and oohs and grosses you can get, the more engagement you've got. You want to engage the brain. You want that multimodal stuff coming off the floor. And so the brain doesn't function as an audio or visual tape recorder. So, you know, we've got to stop seeing it that way and we've got to stop teaching to it that way. Information coming into the brain is constantly being processed. So the brain is asking questions. And this is what we talk about with cognitive schema. It says, have I heard or seen this information before? And if it says yes, okay, it says, well, okay, where does this information fit into my current schema? What can I do with it? Okay, I can add it to that schema as confirmatory knowledge. Or I can hold it up and say, wait a minute, that disagrees with something I already think, know or believe. Can I assume this is the same idea that I had yesterday or last month? And then, of course, we're starting to go through the working memory. Okay, we're starting to look at the structures in our memory from when it comes into our memory, okay, from the short term to the working to our longer term processing. And we can look at this, okay, an active classroom, an active science classroom should create these stages, stages where we acquire learning. In other words, we simply collect it. We then get a chance to rehearse it. Okay, we can start to see this now. Okay, this is starting to look a little bit like the five E's, except there's only four R's. We can look at retention. How do we keep it? And we keep it through rehearsal and practice. And then we store it. We store it in our long-term memory so that we can actually use it and retrieve it. 
So when we look at the memory, okay, there's four stages of learning and these four stages of learning correct to each of our senses, each of our, our levels of memory. So we get aware of a stimulus and the stimulus comes at us all the time. We know, for instance, that our brain is processing such a high rate of information constantly that we are only ever conscious of small pieces and parts of it. Okay, we can look at the processing and it gets processed as an immediate, it's action, seconds, seconds, seconds to minutes as we take this information on board and our brain is actually working out what to do with it, where, what schema does it go to? And this is important for you as a teacher because this is happening when you introduce a concept to your students. It then goes into our working memory. Where does it fit in? Okay. And this can be minutes to hours. If there's no place for it, then that's the, the, the basis of a really good science lesson, isn't it? That you're actually creating a place now to open up the working memory through the processes of you know, awareness, acquisition into rehearsal so that it can then take a place in the long-term memory and become something that the learner retains and perhaps can reflect upon and develop over an entire life. So when we talk about engagement, this is what we're talking about. And motivation is the sustaining of this through pedagogy and assessment. And that's what assessment task two is all about. So a couple of take home points at this stage. Well-planned science lessons provide engaging learning opportunities, okay, and active classes. Part of the planning process involves decisions regarding types of strategies that can be best developed student understanding. Dr. John Biggs talks about the solo taxonomy he published in 1998. Um, used a lot at, at higher education levels, but is a really, really good tool for talking about constructive alignment. Now, constructive alignment is, is really about assessment task number two, or that's what assessment task number two is about. It gives you a model and a strategy to analyze the efficacy of both formative and summative assessment within a unit of study. In other words, it says to you, is that formative assessment, is that summative assessment really addressing the learning outcomes? And if so, does it enable me as a teacher to assign achievement levels? Now, Black and Willem talk to this, for instance, they talk to the strength of formative assessment. Now, a couple of questions people have had in the Moodle this week and had in, in the email is, you know, I'm looking for references, I'm looking for resources. Well, Black and Willem, um, you know, they talk about the black book or the little black box of teaching and learning. And formative assessment is, is it's the oil in the learning chain. It has the highest effect on learning outcomes. So formative assessment is a very, very strong strategy. So you know, again, when we're looking at making recommendations um, for particular units of studies, obviously we're going to be looking at formative assessment strategies and we're also going to be looking at summative ass assessment strategies. And so when we look at engagement strategies, you know, we've talked about the first stage, the engage stage, um, and there's a lot of things we can do there. You know, when you introduce a topic, rather than simply just talking about it, you, you've got to get the interest and the curiosity of the students. Okay, so here's our goal. This is what we're hoping for. Um, is it relevant to them and has the information about their, their present understanding been obtained and incorporated into this first E? Now, that was assessment task number one where we looked at you know, diagnostics and a range of strategies appear here and for doing that diagnostic activity. So you know, I'm gonna pass through this one pretty quickly because that's, that's historical, but it, it has a place in where we're going with this tasks, uh, with this assessment task. So some of the stuff that came from the forum this week, um, again, I had an email just half an hour before coming online. Um, What's a consecutive unit of study? How do, how do I know? I mean, are they two units in the folder on, on the Moodle page um, at the same year level? And the answer is no, they're not. A consecutive unit of study is a pedagogical decision. Now, there can be three strands, science knowledge, science inquiry, or human endeavor. Any of those three strands can act as a connector for, for two units of science, any of the three. It's up to you where you're placing your pedagogical focus. Now, when we look at the Australian curriculum, it's got these three strands well and truly identified. And, and look, this is not new. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Something we don't talk about though, is the science understanding comprises four substrands. Okay, biological, earth and space, chemical, physical. Science as a human endeavor is described in two year bands. Now it's different to the other two which you know, are really age related, science as a human endeavor is stage related. And that's why I often point back to it as the most flexible 
strand of all three. And the two the two year bands they talk about in the nature and development of science and the use and influence of science. Okay, and science inquiry skills is also described in two year bands. So the one we focus on and ask yourself why we do this is the most limiting. The science understanding is is you know is really age based. You know, we've got the foundation as a stage, we know that, the early years. But beyond that, once it gets to year two, three, we're starting to talk about age-based learning right up to age, year 10. And yet, science as human endeavour, science and inquiry skills are by far the most flexible. Okay, and when we look at inquiry skills, there's five substrands in there, questioning and predicting, planning and conducting, processing and analysing data information, evaluating and communicating. So you have a capacity to determine a unit as being, you know, consecutive because one of them is going to look at the planning and conducting of science inquiries and another one may be looking at processing and analyzing data you've got your consecutive link so you can come out in the early part of your assignment and, and, and talk about the consecutive nature of this teaching and learning with a great deal of confidence and the connections you're making another question that's coming off the forum this where should I reference I mean am I going to be referencing throughout the whole you know the whole kit and caboodle three and a half thousand words of stuff had a few emails about the size of this task this week and I'm going to talk about that in this 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 um, um, uh, screencast now um, where should I reference look there, there are eight different knowledges that have been identified in the research and literature um, you've got declarative knowledge um, the what Conditional knowledge is the why, procedural is the how, the application knowledge is, is similar settings and contexts, transfer for knowledge if you like, problem solving, critical thinking, documentation and understanding that is synthesis, synthesis of, of you know, part in the concepts, processes and skills. All of these are what we call knowledges and now this information comes down um, really from a, a too big a source for me to talk about today, but basically what we've got here are eight different ways of knowing what knowledge is. Now, we've got that many different knowledges, so how do we reference? Well, as, as a, what we call someone in, in an undergraduate program, you're dealing with what we call a simple originality. So you're not required to produce new information in any assignment. What you're supposed to do is, is reference to existing information. In other words, you're meant to call on your friends. And we've talked about the big rumble. You don't turn up on your own to an academic rumble. You bring your friends. And the knowledge displays, for instance, one, two, three, four, six, and eight above. So they're the ones that we're talking about we really want you to reference. Declarative knowledge, the what, the why, four, sorry, three is in there too, procedural knowledge, application knowledge, Six, critical thinking, and eight is understanding. So these are the sorts of things we want you to bring out when you're using references. You know, who are you quoting? Um, conditional knowledge, why is this relevant? Says who, okay, in what contexts, to what components? So here you're using these, these knowledges to, to strengthen your position, and this is why we reference. You know, you can pull out the heavy knowledge bombs when you get down to discussing your recommendations. So when you're, you know, you're really getting through this assessment task, there'll be minimal references in, in the, the section where you're talking about your two units. And the, the primary references there will be the units themselves. You may then go on to talk about um, formative assessment and the purpose of formative assessment and, you know, give a couple of examples from the tables you'll produce. You may go on and talk about summative assessment, what the purpose of that is. And again, give some examples from the tables you use. And then you get into your recommendations and that's when you start to draw down the heavy knowledge bombs, the, the very specific academic references. And I'll give some examples, okay, as we go through. So how should your, your response for assessment task look? So the first thing you're going to need to do for a task of three and a half thousand words is you're going to need to keep the reader on side because this, this is, you know, this, this is like a flag to a bull. If you don't keep the reader on side, it's three and a half thousand words of potential frustration for both of you. So take control. Okay. Take control. Start with an explicit introduction to your assignment. So, and the key, what, sh what should an, an explicit introduction sh achieve? Well, allow yourself about 400 words maximum. Begin by clearly identifying your chosen units, the year level applications you're talking about, the elaborations that you're going to include and justify why they're being, you're teaching them 
as a consecutive unit. Justify that. And it needs to be reasoned and supported. In other words, you can't simply say, oh, because, you know, um, they're two really good fun units. Um, you've actually got a reason, okay? Because go back to the strands, the three strands, okay? And, and have a look at the three strands. And from there, um, there's a substrand criteria here too. One has to be chemical, one has to be physical. So, um, you know, you've got plenty to say here, but you don't have to say a lot. Okay. Strategically, your introduction should also signpost where you are taking your audience. This paper or this presentation will discuss two separate primary connections unit or one primary connection, one Australian um, Science Association unit. Um, one of these is in physical areas, physical science areas, and the other is the chemical science areas and name the units. Okay. This paper will discuss formative assessment opportunities in both units of study and present these as a table in section two of the paper. It will then discuss the purpose of formative assessment and the purpose of summative assessment and how these support learner engagement in motivation. From there, I will proceed to make recommendations about how assessment events embedded within these two units can be improved, modified, you know, sexed up, pimped, whatever you want to say, how they can be improved to support the learning outcomes of the unit. That's what we're doing, remember? We're supporting the learning outcomes of the unit. And we'll talk a little bit about John Biggs's work and constructive alignment because it's all about how does assessment support the learning outcomes, okay? So a, a really simple introduction just telling us where you're going and what you're doing. So, and yeah, the key thing here is why not put your recommendations up front? This paper will identify two summative assessment items, two formative assessment items, one being this, one being that, and we'll suggest these can be modified by adding this or by revamping that, okay? Tell us up front, so by the time we get through your paper, we know how you're working, we know what you're leveraging, we know where you're trying to take us. The body of your assignment um, should, should cover two, two specific parts, really. And there'll be an analysis of assessment in your units, and there should be clear section which talks about recommendations for improvements to embedded assessment steps. So when we look at the analysis of your assessment, and I've had a few emails about this and, and quite a few questions in the forum this week, please look at those, the feedback I've given those comments. Um, because you're right, the temptation here is to engage in a long-winded, boring, life-sucking, exercise where you're going through an entire primary connections unit and you're presenting every piece of formative assessment, every piece of summative assessment, and you and the marker are both running for razor blades by the end. Now, try not to go there. Try to be clever. Come up with a table. In the table, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but in the table, list your formative for a unit, list your summative, list your formative for both units in one table, and then list sum summative for both units. And then at the end of those two tables, launch a discussion. Formative assessment, its purposes, its strengths, its focus, its intentions, summative assessment, and throw in a couple of references there. And you can pick examples from your table. You don't need to cover all of them. Okay, we can see their form formative, you've identified them. You've said what stage they're occurring at, what part of the lesson sequence. We can see that. Spend no more time on that. Then get into a discussion about what formative assessment is and when it works best. And pick one of the examples, two of the examples, three of the examples, and show us how formative assessment works, its strengths. Then do the same with summative assessment. Once you've done that, you've laid the groundwork for, for two units of study. You've talked about the functions and the strength and the purpose, the pedagogical intent of formative and summative assessment, how they constructively align in, with learning outcomes to create good teaching opportunities. And once you've done that, you're then in a position where you can have a look at particular assessment items and make very specific recommendations. Now, see the difference between what I'm suggesting and what some of you are trying to do. You can't go through and write three and a half thousand words on two you know, science units, which are essentially 200 pages long. You're gonna to have to summarize them. And then you're gonna to have to make executive decisions, editorial decisions about what formative examples you'll use to talk about formative assessment, what summative examples you use to talk about summative assessment. You'll see the samples on the Moodle 
and I've put them there deliberately, they all scored credits, low credits. Because when you look at those samples, it's like bleeding to death slowly. Okay, all they do is just go through formative assessment item, formative assessment item, summative assessment, and it is mind numbing. Where is, where is the discernment in that? Where is the simple originality in that? Okay, your task is to bring this to life. You've got two parts, analysis of assessment, present it in a punchy way, give detail, show you know the units, then pluck bits of those units and show you know how they work. Okay, that's part one. Second part, pick four recommendations, two formative and two summative, and you've set this up really well now because you've done your tables, you've discussed the purpose of formative and summative assessment, and now you can simply nitpick. You're in control here because you can pick two, formative and two summative, and you can go through and you can apply current research to add value to these, to the items you pick, and you can pull them apart. Now, if you're going to use a rubric, include it. If you're going to suggest this would be enhanced by the creation of a rubric and, and the rubric would need to be gen generally well understood by students, then include that. Okay, include a rubric. It doesn't have to be the world's best rubric. It simply has to be an example of a rubric that would help to elaborate and, and elicit, uh, elicit um, assessment criteria. And again, the key thing is here is current research and best practice. Please, no death by Gregson. Okay, it is intellectual laziness. And it will be seen by that, as that, by your markers. Okay, we can all reach for a Gregson. You know, it's a little bit like a Barocca on a Sunday morning. Okay, it's, it's what you do on the Saturday night that matters, not how many Barocca you take on the Sunday. So the body of your assignment should achieve those two things. Now, a couple of good, good posts on, on the, the forum and in the email, Amy Danger and Paula were three of these people who basically said the same thing. Um, they looked at the samples on the Moodle and they're doing it themselves and all of a sudden they're losing the will to live and they can't work out why. And of course, if you follow it through every, every science unit and you're listing every piece of formative and summative assessment, you will lose the will to live. It's one of nature's laws. So don't get into that kind of regurgitation. Here's one suggestion what I put on the forum for them. How to simply avoid reeling off thousands of words of primary connections content. Okay, chunk it down. Create two tables, one for formative, one for summative. I'm saying the same thing I just said. List the items, the type of assessment, and the stages and the sequence they occur. Then discuss formative assessment. What is it? What's its purpose? Why do we use it? Black and Willem, it's the most, it's the oil, it's the lubricant in our teaching. Okay, choose three to four formative tasks to show how they work, how they're strong, how they connect and engage and motivate learners. Do the same for summative. And once you've done that, congratulations, you've finished that particular component. You can then go on now and just like a chicken, you can free range and you can graze and you can pick four assessment tasks, two formative, two summative, and go through and rework them in a very focused and very controlled way. Now, as you can see, I suggest you do 1,500 words. Um, I might need to go back to point that out. The analysis, 1,500 words, a rough ballpark. Okay, recommendations, 1,500 words. Okay, rough ballparks. Leave some space for editing later as you finish. If you've done that, you've got your intro, you've covered your analysis, you've covered your recommendations, and now you can slide in to your wonderful conclusion where you just tell us what you told us. Now, Carly and the recommendations, then, as I say, they're not a triple J sensation. They are, it's actually another really good forum post. So if you haven't had a look, Carly Stock put up a really good question and I gave some examples. And again, talking about the same thing, about the boredom and this assignment is sucking the life out of me. Don't let it do that. If you're doing that, and imagine how your reader's going to feel if you as the author are not excited by it, it's like giving birth. I mean, you know, you're not in, in, in love with the child, then how can you expect other people to be? A couple of examples I've given here. You know, a unit may feature an investigation using collaborative group work, fantastic. But that can also be a critique of the unit because we know people like McClelland, okay, talks about need for achievement. And Mousley and Campbell go on to talk about the fact that collaborative tasks 
make it hard for individuals to excel. It actually makes it very hard for you to assign ownership of learning. And kids can pick this, okay? Black and, Black and, and Willem tell us this. Kids can pick it and it can therefore turn out to be anti engaging, anti-motivating. So even though we can rave about collaborative group work till the cows come home, it's how we use it. If a hammer is the only tool you have, it's not a good tool. If collaborative group work is the only engaging tool you have, then use it two or three times and kids are gonna spit it out. Example number two, making a model as a representation. All good, get them to build a globe, whatever it is you want them to do, but add peer assessment to it as a summative assessment strategy. Ah, now we're starting to talk because we can look here, uh, Keeley, Keeley talks about motivation. Okay, students will be engaged because it's not about the private act of producing a representation or a model, it's about the very, very public act of sharing that, of becoming, you know, you, you can't really understand something till you've taught it. And this is the whole principle of explicit teaching, isn't it? Yeah, I do. We do, you do, uh, and we're moving from this here. Here, here it is. Here, you know, you're looking at it. Holbrook added engagement, added motivation. The power of ICTs. I was talking to Maxine about this before. ICTs. You know, so many of these modules in Primary Connections talk about a science journal. Oh yeah, bore me to death. Okay, what about an e-portfolio? And there's a couple of things here, what e-portfolios do. Look at it, investigations, predictions, findings, images, videos. Look at all the different things kids can put in there, photos. So even a kid who doesn't talk much, a kid who's very visual, a kid who, who you know, perhaps can't talk much, anyone's working with refugee children will understand what that does to communication. Now, this allows them the flexibility to deal with all sorts of these issues. And we can look at it, it's a, it's a catalogue. It's, it's a progressive catalogue. Um, and it gets ownership and they're all different. No portfolio looks the same and students will lean on you know, their, their ICTs of choice, voice recordings, written work, tables, images, pictures, everything that they love. And, and here we you know, Gardner's multiple intelligence is coming to the foreground here. It's entirely student centered. And a big thing here is, you know, uni and burden, it, it's connected directly to feedback. And one of the things we have to deal with also here is, is feedback and conferencing. So, you know, think, think about these recommendations. Think about how you're going to structure your assignment. Don't simply reel off formative assessment. This is what it looks like, this is what it smells like, this is what it tastes like, here's another one. You know, we're all gonna get fat on formative. Don't do that, okay? Think about a table, here's what it is. Now I've established that, here's how it works. Summative assessment, here's where it is. Here's how it works. Now. Here's how it can actually work better. Here's where the marks come in. Here is where the real value in, in you know, th this assessment task sits. And if you've managed to do all of this, okay, you've spent 400 words approximately on your intro. You spent 1500 words approximately on the two components, the analysis and the recommendations. Um, you're at 3,400 words. Um, it allows you about 350 words under the plus or minus rule. Um, to get into your considered uh, conclusion. And this is the post-coital cigarette. This is where you're lying back there. Here you are in your negligee. Okay, you've got, you've got your little band on, on your hair and you're sitting back here with your glass of champagne and you're telling us what you've told us. Okay, this paper has taken two year three science units from two different strands, substrands. It has demonstrated how these are in fact consecutive through the processes of either science knowledge, inquiry skills, or human endeavour. This paper has demonstrated where the assessment events occur in both of these units and presented these in tables one, two, three, and four. Okay, in doing so, it has established the purpose and the function of formative and summative assessment, how it works in the context of these units, and how it connects and achieves the learning outcomes for these units. What I have added to this, or what I further continue to do, is make recommendations as to how these learning outcomes can be better enhanced. In the first case, I tackled two formative items, this and this, suggesting that this and this would enhance the, the learning outcomes. Looking at summative assessment, I identified this and this, and recommended this and this, suggesting how these two would lead to better outcomes. A global close assessment is an ongoing process. 
okay? It's about the interaction and the interaction is never a fixed event. It's always an ongoing and dynamic thing. And, and you know, just some, some other things here that are in, in your criteria as well. Academic writing conventions must be observed. What I'm saying to you, this is not the only way to do it, but this is a way not to do what some of you are doing and some of you were feeling was wrong. Okay, and I get that feeling. There is nothing worse than writing an assignment you don't believe in. So stop it. There's your solution. Stop it. And write one you do believe in. Okay. Any questions or comments at this point? Everybody's gone stony quiet. Let's see if anybody's still around. Okay, yes, Maxine's there, Loretta's there, Candice. Any comments? Are people comfortable with this? Well, thank you for explaining this really explicitly and well. Thank you, Colin. Not, not a problem. This is not the only way to do it, but this is the answer to some of the questions that I've been given. Um, and I don't want to do this. I find myself doing this. And, and, you know, there's some very good students in this course. And if you're going to go down the path of just, you know, putting up formative, formative, summative, summative, then chances are you're going to be very disappointed with the result. So, you know, let's not do it. Let's, let's find a, um, a different way. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I encourage people to, to try a different approach. All right. So what I'll do is I'll um, move on. It's yes. Maxine. I have a, a question. Um, I'm just, just thinking, this is probably a really silly question, but I'm just going to ask. In my first unit, I've done two formative um, assessments, what I've adjusted. So in the second task, do I have to do two summative assessments or can I do two formative assess assessments or can it be mixed? Look, there's, there's no reason why they, they can't be mixed because you've already covered the criteria of discussing um, formative and summative. If, if you follow the suggestion I'm doing here, you've, you've analysed the unit and you've talked about the purpose of formative and summative assessment in that unit and, you know, you've demonstrated um, how it works and, and how it travels successfully, if you like, and, and, and therefore, you know, the, the pedagogical intent is explicit. Then in your second part, when you come to recommendations, you can mix. You know, you don't have to do them all. If you've already just discussed formative and summative assessment in detail, picked some examples, shown how they've worked, how they strength, what their strengths are, what their applications, what their intention is, how they meet those intentions, you've dealt with that component. You are then totally free to graze, as I said, like a free-ranging chicken over, over that re recommendations part and pick the bits that you really want to address. So you don't have to, you can mix the assessments around, so like it has to be... No, you've already you've already dealt with that kit, that criteria, so you you don't need to keep redealing with it. This is not therapy. This is, you know, this is in fact just an assignment. Okay, thank you, Colin. You're welcome, Maxine. Okay, um, I like using the table on Moodle, but now I'm going to go to jazz it up. Maybe not a complete rewrite um, from Kelly. Yeah, good point. I'm not advocating a complete rewrite. What I'm doing is advocating editorial um, discretion. Um, you want this to be interesting. You want it to reflect what you know. Um, and you don't simply want to be regurgitating what primary connections have already written. So summarise it. Use summarising devices. And then throw what you know down on the page about formative and summative assessment. Give good, clear examples in each of the units. Once you've done that, you're then not tied to too formative and too summative. You can look at your units and say, because this is a, a, a unit focusing on science inquiry skills, I'm going to focus on formative and here's my reason why, and here's what I'm going to recommend. You're in total control. So what do we agree about assessment at this point in time? Okay, hopefully, theoretically, we've got some common ground. And the constructivists believe that learners' preconceptions about science are critical, going right back to the start of this course. Based on this, constructivists vary. We, we try to approach misconceptions by looking at prior knowledge. We try to differentiate. Um, multiple abilities, multi-modes of learning by looking at learning styles. And we try to teach for depth of understanding rather than breadth of coverage. Okay, that's what we're trying to do here. We know also from our work in this, this semester and last semester that we've got five principles of effective assessment. It's got to have purpose and impact. It's got to be valid and fair. It's got to have reliable uh, reliability 
Uh, in other words, if you assess someone now on it and they achieve this, you could assess them again next week and they should achieve the same thing or, or better, depending on what work you do with them. It should be significant and it should be efficient. Okay, we don't want assessment that is going to be inefficient. Okay, we want a feedback, a biofeedback mechanism, doing feeding. The sooner we can give feedback, it's like training a dog. Um, and there's a, a brilliant book written in the United States um, about relationships, and it's all based on, on, on training your dog. Um, and it's selling really well amongst couples, I, I hate to say. Um, but assessment uh, tackles eight knowledge domains. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot going on with assessment. So when we say, what do I reference? Well, you know, there's eight sets of knowledge going on here, you know, declarative, conditional, procedural, application, you know, transitional, transfer of knowledge, problem solving, critical thinking, and right through to, to understanding where, you know, you're then applying knowledge to new contexts and situations. And it comes in different forms, baseline and diagnostic. We're not looking at here formative assessment. We are. Okay. So that's the common ground. That's where we're at. Science by doing, uh, they, they do it quite quite well. The five E's model is a nice way of looking at, at um, assessment. Um, we don't need to do the engage stage. Okay. We don't need to do that. Okay. We can put a line through it because really what we're talking about here is formative and summative assessment only. So we're going to look at the explore, explain, okay, for formative and elaboration for the summative of, of science inquiry and evaluation for the summative of, of, of learning and, and um, science understanding. So We've got inbuilt structure there. You know, we don't have to wonder too much how to do this, how, how to go about um, sorting this problem out. We know it's done for us. Common ground two, we know there are assessment types. Baseline assessments, paper and pencil tests, embedded assessments, and they'll be there in our units. There's a table. That's not it's so hard, to, and it's, it's not hard to read either. So no one's rushing out to slash their wrists at this point in time. If this was a unit, there is my assessment mapped out for me the stage it occurs at, the nature and purpose of it, its description. I now can go in and I can discuss the, the, the formative items there and the summative items there with a couple of examples and I can give a really, really good account of my knowledge as, as a pre-service teacher. Biggs is very useful and he talks about constructive alignment. And so what we're really talking about here, John Biggs is, is you know, he's, he's great, um, an Australian. Um, published in the UK, didn't get famous here in Australia, got pu published only when he went to the UK. But you can see your assessment task here, the two consecutive science units, and it talks about Biggs' model here. So when you're looking at you know, the intended learning outcomes of the curriculum, the assessment regime, and this is what you're putting in your table, and the teaching and learning activities. So there's part one. So what we're doing in this assignment is constructive alignment. There it is, part one. Part two is where you're looking at the assessment strategies and you're asking how well do they line up with the curriculum outcomes? Okay, so here's my marking criteria. Does it differentiate between these levels of achievements? Do my teaching and learning activities you know, oscillate between teacher controlled, peer controlled, self controlled to enable students to move through each of the learning sequences? So, you know, use BIGS or don't use BIGS, I don't mind, but the reality is BIGS is very, very helpful. You know, assessment must be matched against learning outcomes and the teaching learning activities must enable the assessment. There we've got it there. The learning outcomes have come first. The assessment regime must map onto those learning outcomes and the teaching and learning activities must make that assessment regime accessible to learners. Links to Blooms. Again, we can look at Blooms. Everything comes back from Bloom. Um, Anderson in the revised Bloom 2001, uh, there's been a revised Bloom for technology again in 2011-12. Um, Blooms won't go away and Biggs doesn't propose that it should. Um, he bases his level of achievements A, B, C, D and E. Wow, that, that looks amazingly like the Australian curriculum, doesn't it? Smells like it, looks like it. But Biggs and Collis talk about their solo taxonomy and what we talk about here is when someone doesn't have knowledge, Okay, they're at the pre-structural stage. And that's when a teacher comes in as, as Vygotsky would say, as the, the most capable other, the more capable other. You know, you're starting to now structure their thinking. You get them to define, list, name, recall, record. And what we're doing is we're putting a uni structure in place. It's like an interlanguage for thinkers and learners. So we're saying to them, here is a uni structure where they're able to state and describe something. They may not believe it. They may not understand it. They may not relate to it, but it's a principle that they can move from. 
Then we can move to multi-structural thinking. Okay, we're starting now to tease through. You can see the five E's model kicking in here, can't you? Once we do that, we're moving on to relational thinking. Okay, we're getting to some of these heavy verbs. You know, we're starting to pull this apart. And ultimately, we get up to extended abstract thinking, where they're able to use these principles, where they've looked at multi-structural thinking, they've developed relationships between the concepts, and they're now able to extend those relationships into the broader world. Okay, this is what we're talking about here. Does your assessment allow you to do that? And it's all about the base. Okay, when we look at con constructive alignment, and these, these PowerPoints are up online for you, and I put them up deliberately because they're, they're much more text heavy than I would normally like, um, but I want them there for you to give you some uh, degree of, of, of something to refer to. So there's a lot of things happening, um, a balance and synergy between the professional goals of teachers, the wants and needs of students, the curriculum. Let's face it, the curriculum is state mandated. It's not like teachers have a choice. The teaching methods used, well, you pick up primary connections and it tells you the teaching method. So, you know, there's a lot going on here. The assessment procedures are all in place. The psychological and social climate, what we call the learning milieu of the classroom, you know, it can have a huge impact. And the psychological and social climate of the school even. Now, and some research I'm looking at at the moment, some schools believe they're STEM schools. And, you know, STEM you think means I'm better than you. Um, it actually doesn't. It means science, technology, engineering and maths. But when we look at the social climate of the school, it takes on a whole lot of connotations. When we have imbalance in the system, when all of these points don't line up, when we don't have constructive alignment, when we've got an imbalance, and this is the whole principle of Biggs's theory, it's going to lead to poor teaching and surface learning. And that emerges from inconsistencies, unmet expectations and practices that you know, contradict what inquiry teaching tries to promote. Now I've gone on here, and I know it's going on, but I've gone on here to give you some ideas about how to make recommendations. About you know, Recommendations can be really simple things. A really good recommendation can be taking something hypothetical out of a, a, an assessment task and putting something concrete in there, something authentic. And we saw that a week or two ago, where someone took out you know, some, some you know, false materials and put in real bags and real and got students to test real things. Wow, amazing. Simple recommendation. Very, very valid one though. Authentic learning. Google it, you'll find a whole lot of literature and resources. You've got a brilliant resolution there. Vague verbs are one of the things. Okay, um, how do we know if a learning ob objective is met? So our standard of performance has to be really clear. So how do we tell if a student appreciates something? Like are they standing there giving a round of applause? How do we tell if they've become aware of something? I mean, these, these are, you know, as, as, as Bloom would tell us, really, really poor learning, learning outcome descriptors. Are all four steps in the alignment process evident? When you're looking at your, your assessment task and you've picked, you know, you've picked two formative, two summative, or in Maxine's case, you've picked a couple of formative and one summative, or you're choosing all formative because you think that's where you're gonna get bang for your buck. And then you'll make a little comment saying, summative assessment too can be, you know, we can add value to summative assessment in the same way because there's, you know, formative assessment and summative assessment is a continuum. What happens to one happens to the other. So I'm highlighting this by identifying changes to formative assessment. So make sure if you're just gonna focus on formative assessment, it doesn't appear that you're neglecting summative. You know, make a comment about summative and saying, what happens to formative is a continuum into summative. You know, let people know, oh, of course, she's on top of that, she's got that. So when you're looking at your alignment process, are all four steps there? Are the intended outcomes, are they using appropriate verbs? Is the learning environment likely to deliver the outcomes? Uh, are you able to judge how well a student's performance can be met? And does the grading criteria for judging uh, the performance um, does allow you to make a, a valid judgment? A couple of other things when we look at unmet expectations, the assessment approaches, do they emphasize understanding rather than memorization? It's a really good thing. You know, if you're looking at an assessment task, uh, is it focusing on memorization or is it actually focusing on understanding? Are you developing deep knowledge around important conceptual frameworks? And this is the whole thing about going deeper, not broader. Okay, is it building on student prior knowledge? Does it involve collaboration? And how do you use that collaboration? Is it just about people holding hands or is it actually about people critiquing, working, you know, growing ideas?
and opportunities for feedback. Does this assessment task actually allow opportunity for ready feedback? Is the feedback organically built into this task? Or will students feel quite surprised, shocked, and perhaps even alienated um, when, when they get feedback on this assessment task? Or can it be part of the natural process, like a presentation, where, which finishes in a five minute question and answer session? Okay, very, very harmless feedback. Okay, and you can then have rating systems where you know people, a panel of peers can interview at the end. Okay, they, they, you know, they get appointed to the panel and the panel has to interview the presenter. Okay, there's a whole range of ways of dealing with this process. Segers talks about um, this, this on, a con, con, on a grid continuum and identifies you know, six components. Authenticity, the number of measures you use in your assessment, the levels of comprehension, okay, dimensions of intelligence, and relation to the learning process, and of course, responsibility. And you know, this whole notion of authenticity, Segers is big on authentic learning. So it's a reference for those of you looking at authentic learning. Have a look at Segers. But talks about, you know, we've got a good assessment task when it's, it's contextualized, when the skills are being used and assessed in context. When it's decontextualized and atomistic, it's a poor item. The number of measures when you've got multiple measures like a portfolio. The levels of comprehension are high, where you're actually having to demonstrate understanding, so it may involve peers and group explanations. The dimensions of intelligence are many, where you're talking about more than one set of knowledges, procedural, okay, we talked about eight different areas. Relationship to the learning process, okay, it's integrated. It's integrated to learning. Okay, the, you know, the, the assessment piece is not removed from that. And responsibility is placed with the student. Now, if you can look at your assessment task and you can't work out where to make a recommendation, look at Segers and he will say to you that the authenticity of an assessment task is going to add value for engagement and motivation. There's your argument there. So it's, it's, it's a quick fix, but it's a very, very valid fix. Um, Segers did a, a, what we call a meta-analysis based on a whole lot of study done over 20 years. So it's a very, very valid um, table that he's putting forward there. Again, I've rephrased this. I won't go back through it again. It's the same questions again. If you don't know what to ask yourself about um, the assessment tasks, um, here's 10 questions. If you can look at, at, at uh, an assessment task, a formative task, and here's 10 criteria you can apply to it. And if it doesn't answer all of those criteria, then that gives you an idea of where you can make some recommendations. And you can then simply modify that task in the simple and effective way. And again, creativity. We talk about science, STEAM, esteem. Um, we add the arts in there. The arts is just, a, for me, a, a really compelling part of science. Now, in, we've almost completed an entire term of chemical and physical sciences and had no laboratory. Um, all we've done is talk about things and concepts and internalise processes. Um, you know, that, that's, that's creativity, what we're doing. It's, it's creativity. And this is how science can be taught. It can be taught extremely well using role play, using you know, innovation, using creativity, all of these key skills. And when we add the E to it, we get esteem. And esteem, the E is for empowerment, where kids do this sort of thing, where they're taking on real world problems in simulated contexts, and they're able to piece together real world solutions. Um, and again, this goes back to Haberman's comments about problems and contexts and issues with which they feel you know, passionate. The last word for this week belongs to Vygotsky. And I'm not going to read through all of that. He just talks about the ZPD. Wood talks about scaffolding. And the ZPD produces a foundation for teachers to build their approach to support student learning. So you don't begin teaching at the edge of student understandings. You burrow down like a ferret. You go right to the core of those understandings to the ZPD. And then you'll split your classroom. You'll become a sage on the stage to get everybody going. You'll be a meddler in the middle as you move around different groups, working out who is who. And then you'll be a guide on the side as the learners start to own the process and start to step in to that science framework. Achievement gains okay, can be used with formative assessment. And Black and Willem you know, identify that as, as the largest feature, the largest, feature, the largest effect on teaching and learning is formative assessment. So if you, you know, 
Maxine's quite right. If, if you can't find a lot of um, recommendations in, in the summative, focus on formative. Go back to Black and Willem. Have a good look at what they said and then bring that to bear. And there's also a need to align formative and summative work in the overall systems. And here again, I go back to Maxine's point and I appreciate you being in this discussion, Maxine, because you ask the questions other people don't. So it's really good. Do I have to do all, you know, too formative and too something? Do I have to look equal? No, you don't. You have to look informed. But by doing that, just make sure you say, as Black and Willem do, that what happens in formative assessment must be aligned to what happens in summative assessment. So you're demonstrating the knowledge you have to make that balance, to keep that system balance as, as um, John Biggs would suggest we, we need to do. Um, so to take full advantage of formative uh, changes in, in formative assessment, now we also need to apply the, that same continuum of change, conceptual change to, to our, our summative assessment. Now I've covered a lot of territory here tonight and I know it's gonna create some questions. Does anybody have any they'd like to start with now? Well, don't all rush me. Colin, I'll just ask, it's Candice, sorry. I'll just ask a quick question. Please, um, Candice. Might, might be a bit of a silly one, but um, I've set my tables up um, in the units. And so I've done the formative and then the summative for the one unit and then moved on to the second unit and done the formative and then the summative. Is that okay? I know that's not how you explained it tonight. But. No, that's quite all right. Now, obviously from there, you're still in an excellent position where you can pick up aspects of formative assessment, link them to the units of study and show the power and the poetry of those aspects of formative assessment at work. Yep, you're... You know, you don't need to do one table, one discussion, another table, another. You're quite all right to do what you've done, Candice, that the power of your discussion now lies in how well you bring those examples that you choose and, and the, the components of, of, of you know, formative assessment to life in your discussion. Yeah, so look, don't feel that you need to change your tables. Okay, thank you very much, Ta. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yep. yep. work from what you've got. Any other questions? Colin, just one, um, one thing to check with you. Um, for my analysis, the primary units are um, <laughs> not challenging for the students. Um, so my approach has been to look at, uh, rather than following um, the structured process, is I love using a project. So it's a project-based um, approach that will uh, justify um, the two units that I've chosen, which are chemical and physical science. It's uh, melting moments. It's the year, year three. Um, so I'm just taking the approach of um, addressing a unit through a project. Is that acceptable? Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. And clearly that's going to shift your assessment strategies too, isn't it? You're probably moving yes. much more towards portfolio-based assessment yes. and the continuity of that because all learners will be at different points of the scale um, and, and the process. So absolutely, there are. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No problems. Quite innovative, yeah. I mean, and this is the thing about primary connections. They're written in a simple language so that we've got a common starting point, but they're, they're really, that's all they are, a starting point, you know, and, and I think if we look at them seriously, we can apply a lot of teaching knowledge to um, these, these units of science. They're good, robust units. Um, and, and my message to you from this course and the last course is they're there. They're always there. And there's a website there on background information on how to teach them everything. Um, but think about how you can actually improve them. You know, that's what we do as teachers. That's what we bring, that X factor. And, and that's what our learners need us for. I mean, they can read them just as well as we can. So it's, you know, it's, it's that X factor that we're really trying to grow here. Any other questions? If not, I'll, I'll hit the leave the meet button and we'll get this recorded and get it posted. I appreciate it. we've covered a lot of territory tonight. Um, and, and so next week there's no new material. So, um, I just want you to know that. Um, so there's no new material. So we, we can concentrate on discussing this 
uh, set of material and the proposals I've raised here about, you know, if you don't want to do the assignment, you don't want to do, then do something you do want to do. Um, we, we can discuss that at, at infinitum. So as, as we talk about that over the next week, so no question is too silly. Um, and I do really hope that you'll, you'll start firing them in now so that you can make a difference and do the assignment that you want to do, do it justice. All right, if there's no other comments or questions. Yes, Colin, um, sorry, it's Candice again. Can I just ask another question? You sure can, Candice, why we're here. Um, for the um, recommendations, I was wanting to go on um, a differentiation approach, so embed um, Indigenous perspectives into my lesson. Lovely. Is that's okay? That's brilliant. I mean, that's an obvious one, isn't it? It's one of our cross-curriculum priorities. And um, yeah, absolutely. Th th these, these concepts do bring in, um, particularly if you're looking at something along the food sciences, food chemistry sciences, there's just huge capacity there to introduce Indigenous perspectives. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good point. Really good point. All right. Look, once again, thank you all for your attention. And um, Look, good luck. Please shoot through questions and I'll keep trying to feed back ideas and, and keep trying to poke the bear because I actually do believe there's some really, really good students and some really, really great science ideas coming off the floor in this course. And we've just got to keep them flowing at least for the next week and a half till it's over. Okay. Um, good luck with everyone. And, and um, look, I look forward to, to receiving any further questions. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Colin. Nice. Good night. Bye-bye. Thanks.